Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and as it sometimes comes up, I am a Florida man, and I am very excited that the Mises Institute is coming on down to the free state of Florida in the wonderful city of Tampa. On February 25th, we are having a Mises meetup on how to think about the economy. As you may guess, that features the great Dr. Per Bylan, the author of How to Think About the Economy, a primer. I will also be speaking, as will Jeff Dice and Brett Lindell, a buddy of mine, actually, who appeared on the Economics for Business podcast, one of my favorite episodes of that series. Over the last year, it's been awesome uh, being at these events and having listeners come up and say that they enjoy the show. So if you are in the Tampa area, I would love to meet you. Um, it is, again, February 25th, uh, starts at 10, goes on till 2. There's also an additional a social event at the World of Beer. Um, if you want to learn more, Check out Mises.org slash Tampa. Hope to see you there. Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, as usual, is my co-host, Tho Bishop, who's also my associate editor here. And uh, we're going to talk about the dollar and the Fed a little bit today. Uh, yesterday, Wednesday, was uh, the February 1st meeting, uh, which really started on the 31st of the Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve. So what that means is they get together and they decide, what are we going to do with interest rates? Are we going to raise them, lower them, leave them the same? And what are we going to do with our giant uh, $8 trillion portfolio? Are we going to keep all that on the books? Or are we going to sell it off? And what that means is, are we going to devalue the dollar? Or are we going to try to get it to increase in value relative to other currencies? Is essentially what it means in, in the international sense, in uh, the simplified way. And so what they did do is they decided to raise the target policy rate, that is the federal funds rate, a quarter of a percent, or what you might call 25 basis points. Now, this is a retreat from the big increases that we'd seen over the past year. So in many cases, we'd seen 50 basis point increases or half a percent or 75 basis points even uh, on several occasions. And so that had meant that they increased over the past year that target rate from, uh, well, they increased it by four and a half percent. And that's a fair amount uh, over such a, a, a short period of time, although I would say that given that this target interest rate is still below significantly the inflation rate, which is now officially at 6.5%, and the federal funds rate is 4.7.5%, that still says that the the situation is still loose in terms of easy money historically if we look at it over recent decades so th this is not a situation where uh oh my goodness the federal reserve is just really tightening up the money supply they're gonna just really really cause a massive deflation uh inflation is gonna gonna come to screeching halt any second now they're really taking a very very slow and mild approach uh, so any talk about how it's just so extreme or huge is um, really just not accurate in my view and then now the fact that they're reducing it to just a quarter uh, of a percent to their latest increase uh, that that suggests that they're going to be done with that before too long, and then maybe even go in reverse and start reversing it again as soon as uh, unemployment ticks up even the slightest bit. So that seems to be where we're at with the Fed right now. They're giving, although they're saying that, oh yeah, we're going to keep tightening, we're not done yet, we're not going to stop until we're looking at the corpse of inflation uh, I'm not as confident. It's possible still. You never know what Powell really believes. I mean, these people will say anything publicly. Who knows? Um, but there's still a chance for them to check it out. <laughs> While inflation is still 5 6 7%, then it can always just uh, have a second wave like it did in the 1970s. So, uh, so much of it is speculation. This is not Volcker territory. Um and I don't know when uh, the narrative is going to start admitting that a lot of the uh, 
economic signals are flashing inflation. There still seems to be very little willingness to admit that in the larger market. They're still clinging to the employment data. So I don't know what the narrative is going to be next week. That's uh, pretty much what uh, my narrative is for this month. Um, and uh, we'll see then. We've got just got to wait till the next one. And the Fed can always just turn on a dime and completely invent a totally new uh, position for themselves. What they say they're going to do next month uh, doesn't actually mean anything. They can completely change their minds between now and then. So who knows what's going to happen? Well, I think Powell's statement yesterday was really a master class in Fed speak because you know you don't know what the Fed's going to do. Wall Street certainly doesn't know what the Fed is going to do because you could almost see in, in real time, like Powell starts off even though you know a quarter point is lower than previous rate hikes of, of recent history, um, you know he starts off with a very hawkish sort of sentiment. You know that that you know we continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive stance for quite some time, and then yeah, all of a sudden you know his his language starts to change. And uh, you know it, it is important that, that overall financial condi conditions reflect. Um, that that you know, there are the tightening is happening, and that our, our focus is not on short-term moves, but on sustained changes in financial conditions. And all of a sudden, Wall Street, which is which is you know, flashing red, all of a sudden starts spiking, and Bitcoin starts spiking, and all these all these assets just start spiking because they are finally seeing those cracks in Hawk Powell's armor coming about. Um, now, again, to, to what degree will this hold on over time? Again, you know. No one expected the Fed to be in this position a year ago. Um, you know, the, the Fed has routinely proven to do things that it explicitly said it was not going to do just a, a few months prior in terms of the size of previous rate hikes. Um, a pivot is is you know, fully within the cards at, at any time now if the pressure gets too high. And, and what is what is telling, I think, right now is that you're know, talking to normal people in my community for the last couple months, you know, I, I live in Florida, so I know a lot of real estate you know, agents. I know a lot of people, um, you know, within the sales world that deal, you know, that, that where interest rates really kind of affect the, their, their business success or, or failure. And I've never had more people, you know, wanting to talk about the Fed than I have in the last couple weeks, because finally that sort of pressure is building, particularly with with the home market here. Everyone wants, and and, and of course, uh, uh, you know, people that know me know that I'm interested in this vague economics thing. They don't quite know what what this this Mises guy is, but they know. Okay, I, I talk about the Fed, and so they want to come and they want to complain about the Fed because interest rates are making their business harder, and um, and so so now everyone everyone's paying attention to this in ways that they they, they might not have just a few weeks or a few months ago. And for all of the discussions that we have about the impact and influence of, of big banks and, you know, the, the, the big oligarch class, and all, which, again, a lot of strings attached, a lot of power there, not, not trying to dismiss that, as Barney Frank, legendary Barney Frank, um, the, the, the atrocious uh, Massachusetts longtime uh, Democrat congressman, um, as he, he'd like to remind people, there is no more influential political class in this country than realtors. Because they have, there, there, there is more realtors per congressman than just about any other pressure group out there. And so when we think about what the Fed's gonna do, we, we can talk about warnings from Wall Street, we can talk about warnings from the UN, we can talk about you know, disapproval from, from fellow central bankers, you know, that, that, is, that is one d deal of pressure that, that Powell can put up with. It's quite another when you start having the, the, the oven really turned on full blast from well-organized constituency groups that are filling the offices of the congressmen who, you know, talk about the independent Fed. I talk about the independent Fed all the time, but are having regular meetings with the Fed officials trying to figure out, you know, what is going on here. And that, that's where... Again, you know, the, 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 the Powell has been more aggressive in interest rate hikes than, than, than I thought was, was going to happen over the, the past year from now. Um, but, you know, the, the, the number of the, the, the odds of a significant pivot um, or, or in, in starting with kind of just a, a flat line, uh, I, I think are definitely increasing uh, by the day. In spite of all the great economic news we're, we're, we're told is going around. 
Yeah, and that's that's really unfortunate too. And I think the the National Association of Realtors situation, which of course is is uh, <laughs> outside realtor circles, is something of a joke, right? Because you always know now is a great time to buy. Is what the NAR is going to tell you, and uh, there's there's never a bad time uh, f- to to buy more real estate. It's just this is just you always know what they're going to say, right? You can just count on you're never going to ask your realtor if you should time things differently. No, you should buy now. Real estate always goes up. It's always wonderful, and they're so wedded, of course, to federal policy that's going to help out um, their business. And so what you have is a potentially a very nice business organization that really should be devoted to laissez-faire because uh, so many of these realtors are essentially small business people, right? Uh, And they also have that mentality in many cases. But their organization, especially at the national level, is all about easy money. It's all about federal intervention to subsidize their industry. And so that short circuits what I think would normally be good sentiments and good work coming out of the realtor community. Um, now, of course, they don't see it that way. They don't see it as a subsidy for their business. And then, of course, the way that the, uh, the tax structure works, too, also really helps out in terms of investing in real estate. Um so uh, it's a lost opportunity there to have a very nice, uh, potentially anti-central bank organization on your side, because they're simply not going to take a position that, of course, the central bank should just let interest rates float. <laughs> because wh- as soon as they did that, they would start to see interest rates go up substantially, and then they would start be begging uh, for federal intervention again to get interest rates ba- back down. And we see that, of course, from Wall Street, too, who at least... 10 years ago, imagined themselves as great engines of capitalism. I don't know if they still kid themselves uh, about that, but uh, it was, of course, true in the past, but now it's not because you can just see them in social media begging the Fed to turn on the easy money spigot uh, again. And uh, what it does mean, though, is there's a lot of interest in what the Fed is doing. Unfortunately, a lot of that interest is geared toward more Fed intervention and pushing interest rates back down. And we we really need to be moving in the opposite direction. When we had Mark uh, Thorne on here last week, right? What is the proper position for the Fed? It's not actually to be manipulating the interest rate all the time. It's actually just to get it to the point to where you wean the market off these ultra low rates and you actually let the market determine what are interest rates in the market overall. Now, that probably would be considerably higher than where it is right now. We don't actually know that for sure, Um, because we don't know what the natural interest rate would be, neither does the Fed, Uh, but that is where we should be. So I'm glad that people are interested in the Fed and they have some sense of what it does now. That's actually arguably better than where we were 25 years ago when nobody had ever heard of the Fed, and yet the Fed, while not as powerful as it is now, was certainly very powerful. Um, But so much of the narrative now is caught up with what's the Fed going to do next and how is that going to help my business or hurt my business? And that just shows how little free market stuff's going on. I mean, we look at the fact that uh, in its portfolio, the Fed after, um, well, it just really started buying up trillions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities. There's another uh, subsidy for, for for real estate right there. They're actually buying uh, private MBSs to keep values up. And then they added another, I don't know, $3 trillion or so, I think, after 2020, just to keep the real estate markets afloat. Um, and now they're at the point where they're just holding more than 20% of all of the $11 trillion of debt that's in the United States in terms of mortgage debt. So... That's not a free market. There's nothing free market about there. And the only reason you're not seeing the value of those investments crash and thus secondary markets and also overall real estate values crash is because the central bank, essentially a government organization, is buying up all of this private stuff. So um, that needs to be brought to an end. Uh, But good luck selling that to the realtors, I guess, although I'm sure there's some brave souls out there who will take a principled stand on that no matter what. Yeah, there, there are, there, you know, there, there are a few out there that still have, you know, they they, they have a sense of principle and they, they kind of recognize the the, the game that the, their their industry has right now. And of course, if anyone out there has not listened to um, the episode of the Human Action Podcast with Alex Pollock, um, that uh, 
it was a few few weeks ago now if you want to talk about just a, a breakdown on just how you know even referring to a housing market as kind of a a laughing matter at this point, given the degrees of intervention that, you know, between the Fed and various programs and the GSEs and everything that is built in and amplified ever since, you know, the, the wonderful housing bubble of 2008. Um, I, I highly recommend that listen. Um, and, and of course, there, there, there is as well of, of the, the domestic internal politics, you, you do have this additional layer of cracks within the, the international sphere as well, um, it's, it's a different sort of dynamic than you know Congress suddenly being being very interested in what Mr. Powell is doing. But these cracks are are also fascinating, and I, I think that they are not simply a byproduct of the Fed's monetary policy, though that is a big part of it. You, you can kind of see, it, I think, within the inter international branch of things, kind of two different camps with the way that they're considering. The, the Fed's current actions. One are those, let's, let's call them you know, allied countries, particularly when we consider the, the Ukraine issue, when we consider the, the larger sphere of, of you know, global neoliberalism and, and the, the international liberal order, uh, rules-based order, whatever the, the catchphrase is that justify really bad things from the, the, from the good side of people. Um, you know, the, the Europe... You know, the ECB and, and Bank of England and those folks, they don't like any tightening that, that goes beyond what they're trying to do because they have pressures and they've been remarkably irresponsible with smaller scale economies than the U.S. has. They've got even you know, worse um, you know, pension plans, and things like that. And so the pressures of a higher interest rate economy or high, yeah, high, higher interest rate monetary system um, you know, are, are particularly problematic for them. Um, and, and I know that there's, there's kind of been some shots across the bow at, hey, Fed, you know, stop doing this. You're, you're, you're making it hurt. On the other side of things is that you have the skeptics of this liberal international order, th th those guided more by nationalistic, perhaps self-interest, who are concerned about the glowing growing sort of, uh, uh, you know, global homogenous state of, of international affairs. And Ryan, you had an article out um, recently on the threats to the petrodollar from the Saudis being one such camp that is willing to entertain alternatives to the dollar for oil purchases. There's some other ramblings with, with South America and some of the leaders down there. I'm um, doing some interesting things. And, and what I find fascinating about this is that there is a clear economic component that the Fed, again, Powell, for, for, for all of his faults and, and, and the, the well documented on Mises.org, Powell does seem to be a little bit more proactive. Um, you know, it took him a year, of, you know, half a year talking about, you know, transitory inflation, but he's a little bit more proactive than some of these other really bad central bankers. And so there's there's the economic side where America is is kind of nudging or has been nudging a little bit more aggressively on some sort of, of normalization and backtracking of the monetary hedonism of the day. But there's also a very clear political side of things where, you know, countries like Brazil and Argentina, you know, when I think about the Lula government and I think of, well, just about any major Argentinian leader in recent history – Physical responsibility isn't exactly the first thing that comes to mind, right? So there, there's a clear sort of political dynamic on the one side and an economic dynamic on the other that is creating very clear tensions. And given the degree to which American dominance on the global stage has allowed and empowered so much of what the Fed's been able to do, uh, allows Americans to enjoy a higher quality of life than we would have if we had the same sort of economic system without the, the complete global dominance on you know foreign reserves and things like that. This is one of those dynamics where it's 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 the consequences of rising interest rates at home. People are talking about now, but I think the international sphere is where things are really going to get interesting because that's a lot harder, I think, to contain once 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 that uh, you know that that ship starts sailing. Yeah, one thing that you notice when watching these press conferences with Powell is how limited the discussion really is. Uh, might even describe it as parochial, right? Almost all of the questions out of the press. And I think in this last press conference and yesterday's press conference, every single question was just some, you know, how does this affect domestic 
uh, inflation? How does this affect domestic employment? Why aren't you uh, lowering rates again, given this domestic data? And no mention of two other major factors that Powell has to take into, into uh, uh, consideration. One is that how much can the federal government actually afford to pay in terms of interest, right? So the federal government, because it has $30 trillion of debt, its interest rate matters a whole lot as to how much it's going to pay on that and how much of your uh, of your tax dollars is then just going to go to nothing, into oblivion, into the outer darkness to pay off past uh, congressional profligacy, right? Um, so that's one issue Powell needs to think about is that the feds are going to throw an absolute fit if they find that they're going to have to pay five, six, seven, eight percent uh, interest on their thirty trillion dollar debt, and that's a huge political issue. No, really, no mention of that almost ever. Uh, but the other issue that you bring up, the third big issue, I think, is how is the dollar relating then in the global economy to other currencies? And that's something that can never be quite ignored uh, or ignored at all, really. And that's that's an important issue because other states, they have currencies that do compete with the dollar. And right, you see some things where they're trying to, hmm, maybe we can build up some sort of rival to the dollar. I would assume that's part of this project we're hearing out of Argentina and Brazil, where they're like, hey, we're going to have a common currency and we'll start building a South American common cur currency. Well, if your building blocks are Argentina and Brazil, I don't think that's going to go anywhere, really, in terms of attracting a whole lot of international uh, capital. Oh, gee, let's get in on that deal with the Argentinian currency. I mean, this is a country that has like a major currency crisis every 10 years. And of course, uh, Brazil is just a complete mess. So uh, <laughs> I find that to be an interesting plan, but not really something uh, that uh, the dollar has to worry about. What the dollar does have to worry about probably is other uh, competing currencies from large states and also geopolitically powerful states. That's the thing, right? We can talk about all of this stuff from a purely economic view all day long. We can look at a bunch of economic charts, uh, and that's that can be very important data. On the other hand, geopolitics is always very important as well in terms of where is your currency and uh, what are you doing with it and what does that mean for the power of the U.S. state internationally. And that's what we're trying, what we sometimes are hitting up against with the Ukraine situation now and the petrodollar situation. So you're looking out there and the, the value of the dollar does depend very much so on how much international demand there is for. This isn't just about managing the unemployment rate within the United States or even just the American banking system. What we find is that outside the U.S., banks hold dollars um, at a level, dollars and dollar-based capital and assets at a level that's at least half, it looks like, of the entire U.S. banking system. So this is huge, many trillions of dollars, uh, at least $12 trillion. And depending on how you count it, possibly a lot more than that. So you've got all that. And, and, and within those, those international dollars, which, we, which people generally call euro dollars, are the petrodollars. So the petrodollars are an important portion of the euro dollar market. They're international dollars, and, but they're dollars that uh, are used to buy and sell oil. And they're, they're closely tied to what currency does Saudi Arabia want to use? And then if Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Arabia insists on using dollars, that means other countries in OPEC and then uh, so other oil producing countries are going to use dollars as well because Saudi Arabia just tends to dominate there. And then countries that need to buy oil, they're going to use dollars. So then you've got all of these countries that are bringing in dollars, there's more demand for dollars, and then the agreement, the original petrodollar agreement with Saudi Arabia, is that they would plow those dollars back into American capital and help keep down the interest rate on American debt. So you can see how it's all intertwined there. And so what's been happening recently is that Saudi Arabia is saying uh, to China and Russia, yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah, we'll still use dollars, but we'll use your currency too. And we'll start opening ourselves up to using other types of currency. And India now is entering into agreements with India and, or with China and Russia in terms of uh, having trilateral, bilateral agreements 
uh, in terms of, okay, we don't have to settle our international accounts in dollars, as has traditionally done because of the euro dollar situation, because there's all these dollars sloshing around and international banks and uh, the Soviets and later the Russians held a lot of these dollars because uh, they didn't want to hold them in American banks for obvious reasons, right? And so as long as you got all those dollars out there, let's just use that to settle all of our accounts internationally so that there's a common currency we can all use. Well, they're moving away from that. And the petrodollars is just the latest sign of that, that, okay, yeah, dollars are great, but they're not as great as they used to be. They're, the, the value of the dollar isn't relatively far and away more important and more valuable than these other currencies as was previously the case. So there's this, it's not that the value of the dollar um, is going down relative to these other currencies, but that the gap between the dollar and these other currencies is becoming less in many cases. And so at least in political, at least in geopolitical terms. And so they're saying, hey, let's just use other stuff. And so that can be a real threat to the dollar then. And it doesn't, you can't see that in some, you can't, there's not an economic argument that explains that away. These are states that are interested in maximizing their power. That's what states do. And they're trying to find uh, new ways of using the dollar that enhance their power. And if, uh, if using less dollars and then having agreements using other currencies helps them as states, they're going to do that, even if some chart somewhere shows that the dollar is holding its own. So these relative values between the dollar and other currencies, very important, not just on an economic level, not just for the banking system, but in terms of international politics. And that's why we're seeing a desire to move away from it, because the U.S., by sanctioning every other country that that does something that slightly uh, annoys Washington, that just gives everybody more motivation to free themselves from the dollar economy and find some other uh, currency to use. And so that pushes, that, that creates inflationary pressure on the dollar because fewer people want it. And then that, that tightens the options even more for Powell in terms of pushing down uh, interest rates, buying up more assets and generally just inflating the dollar. He can't inflate it as much as he used to be able to get away with, or the Fed can, because now there's less international demand for it. Will that will that really start to get rapid? Will it run away from us really fast so that the dollar just collapses? I don't think that's likely in the near future, but I do think it it now creates more of a parity, parity between the dollar and other currencies. And that's that's bad news for the Fed because it, it reins them in and restrains what they can do. And it could lead really to more inflation and more just entrenched inflation for American consumers for the next 20 years or so. And this is why ultimately, in spite of, you know, the, the growing threat of nuclear war, you know, that, that little thing, um, and, and just the, the, the general material consequence of this inflationary decaying kind of global economy that we have right now, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about the long-term trend only because the sort of momentum from all the very serious people that gather in very nice areas of the world to talk about future planning, it was all built on currency centralization, right? This, this was the discussions about how, you know, the IMF um, could increase the use of SDRs um, their special drawing rights as a alternative to the dollar to kind of further centralize global monetary policy, you know, calm the next inevitable crisis. Uh, the IMF could bail out the, the Fed the same way that the Fed bailed out the world in 2008. And, and therefore, and then, then we can throw in the, 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 the new bells and whistles of, of you know, central backed digital currency and all that like. And therefore, you know, you'd end up having the creation, the establishment of an even more powerful central bank for the world. And that would, you know, and the argumentation would be that, oh, well, this, this will transcend politics, right? Um, it, it will transcend these, these nasty little populists and, uh, you know, these, these nativists and all of these uh, primitive uh, uh, tribal mentalities that care about their own national sovereignty and the like are going to get away, going to get, get in the way of all of the, you know, this, this, this global neoliberal order that, um, you know, we're, we're going to sweep in. And, and this is, you know, still, I mean, uh, Michael Rechtenwald, um, for those that have been following the World Economic Forum, Michael Rechtenwald's article um, uh, uh, 
uh, on the 24th, uh, Mastering the Future, the megalomaniacal, or the, the uh, megalomaniacal ambitions of the WEF is a great breakdown of the, the recent Davos conference. And, and in particular that, you know, one of the major themes was that fragmentation still is the number one boogeyman of this group. And then ultimately when I hear all of these developments within the monetary sphere, all of it is fragmentation, right? It, it, it is, and this kind of started, right? You know, the, the, the seeds, of, and again, I think we've done a pretty good covering this, uh, coverage of this on, on Mises.org, on, on this podcast and elsewhere that, you know, regardless of the, you know, and, and not to downplay the human toll, the true devastation, I mean, the, the, the cost of, of life, liberty, and treasure that goes on when we have an active war zone. And, you know, the best thing for humanity is for that, for, for, for peace to come tomorrow, um, which is why governments are doing everything they can to insist on prolonging this as long as they can down to the last Ukrainian. Um, but, but regardless of the, the human toil of the Ukrainian situation, the economic response as the initial wave of retaliation from the West kind of kicked off and kind of highlighted what had already been a growing trend of the weaponization of the dollar as the ultimate extension wing of American foreign policy and by extension, the Western world. And so again, it started off with a weaponization against Al Qaeda backers, and then it became weaponization against North Korea and then Iran. And now when you start using it on Russia, you have countries like Saudi Arabia, you have countries that have more nationalistic in, uh, uh, inclinations to them, a little concerned about America's larger worldview and the imposition of our values upon their little uh, kingdoms and, and, and little you know, their, their parts of the world. And that is what's, again, it, it is these political concerns more than the, the economic troubles that is, 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 is forcing this kind of reconsideration of the global order. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm, it, it's, it's, it is concerning when I don't think, again, when, when you talk about the, the triteness of, of many of the, the questions being asked in these Fed hearings, um, and obviously you, you watch any sort of congressional hearing, you, know, you sit down and watch a financial services committee hearing, uh, you know, no, no one there is talking seriously about you know, the real consequences to America should this trend continue. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, 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 the de-armization of, de armament of the dollar um, which fragmentation does become, uh, but I, I think fragmentation fuels that, um, can help offset some of the worst ambitions that people were openly talking about, you know, over the course of the last you know, 15 years or so. And when you consider we think in the connection with you know, digital currencies, when you consider the, 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 you know, tech authoritarian states that are being used through you know, tracking transactions and things like this, the more that we can just kind of throw, you know, t tear down that assumed inevitability of centralization, the better off we are. And it, it, it requires even, again, I've, I've got you know, not, nothing well to say about you know, the, the Lula regime in Brazil and, and the current uh, leadership of Argentina. You know, hey, more power to them if they want to, to, to openly question their reliance upon the dollar and elsewhere, because I think ultimately this is a very healthy trend and a necessary trend in the global battle because I think ultimately this this sort of populist, this sort of disruptive political moment for all the distractions and not to dis, again, not to, to downplay the various issues that are coming up, but ultimately the, 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 the number one political issue as I see it has always been either the further centralization of politicized money or the decentralization of money, which can allow for not only very nationalized controlled currencies, which I have no doubt, again, no doubt that a South American you know, currency, given the ideologies that are guiding those governments right now, will very quickly become a disaster, right? I, you know, I would not be going long on, you know, a, a Brazilian, Argentinian pegged project there. Um, but that creates the opportunities for non-state monies, I think, to have a better fighting chance. And that would be a very good thing for, for all the other topics that, uh, that are coming about, um, both domestically and internationally. Yeah, uh, what did they think was going to happen uh, <laughs> with the way they were weaponizing the dollar, right? So it's uh, Iran doesn't like what we're doing, so we're going to cut them out of the international banking system. We're going to use the banking system to enforce sanctions. Then Russia's doing what we don't like doing, so we're going to cut them out of the SWIFT system, which was just basically a communication system for clearing uh, these international transactions. 
And so, if, and then China looks at that and they know, oh, well, gee, if we do anything the U.S. really doesn't like, they'll try to do the same thing to us. So, of course, they're motivated, highly motivated, to find some way to get around the dollar. Now, we should note that even if the dollar does go into decline, the IMF is going to try and patch that together with some sort of centralized response. So uh, the IMF will create like a basket of currencies and create their own international money, even if it's only done at the wholesale level. Uh, so everyone's still using their national currencies domestically, but international uh, exchanges are, are governed by this IMF controlled currency, and we'll make sure that's centralized and that it's uh, basically a digital currency that we can totally control. And they'll try that. Now, of course, if you're still, though, if you're if you want to be not controlled by the IMF, which is essentially controlled by the U.S. and it's in a handful of U.S. allies, you're going to want to be separate from that. So they're going to want to create this separate monetary block that's not going to be beholden to that. So it's over. I mean, yeah, it's not over this month or next week or next year even, but this whole Bretton Woods turned into a dollar standard thing where the dollar becomes the world reserve currency, that's going to come to an end. All reserve currencies, they cease to be the reserve currency at some point, right? The French franc was the reserve currency of the 18th century, and then the, the pound was the reserve currency, and then it actually lost it to the dollar and then gained it back again after that, and so it's not like a one-time thing. But now the dollar's reserve currency. Okay, but, you know, that's not like written on stone tablets somewhere. That sort of stuff doesn't last forever. So you're just, you're not that clever if you just chortle and say, ha ha, the dollar, you know, has no rivals. Yeah, okay, well, uh, it will at some point, always happens. How fast? I don't know. But clearly moving in that direction now, and that half of the world is highly motivated to do it. This includes India, by the way, which uh, has very close interests in keeping close ties uh, with Russia and China. So that's not going to go away either. So you've got you know a few billion people highly motivated to get out from the thumb of the dollar and uh, the West control of the dollar. So that's... Uh, it's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. It would be nice if some of these reporters occasionally acknowledged that uh, the international sphere is actually important in terms of how the how the dollar works. Um, but uh, that's if a lot of the takes I'm seeing actually from the domestic press are really quite terrible. I, I started to see articles from the Wall Street Journal on how the U.S. needs a central bank digital currency in order to compete uh, in the international sphere. So we need uh, we need a Fed controlled digital currency, or people will stop using the dollar stuff. Boy, that is a terrible, terrible reason to adopt a central bank digital currency. Uh, it's And, of course, it's all tied to national security, right? It's the same old horrible Cold War argument. Abandon freedom now uh, or, or else uh, the international sphere, or else the, the commies will conquer us. And so, yeah, reject that completely. If anything, what the U.S. really should be pursuing is a very valuable hard currency backed by something other than just the whims of the central bank. Could be Bitcoin, could be some other uh, digital currency not controlled by the central bank, could be gold, could be silver, who knows? Um, but the last thing we need is something controlled by the IMF or the Federal Reserve. And if you had a truly valuable currency that wasn't just controlled by politicians, then people would want to use it because they would know that it would truly hold value. And then the gap between that currency's value and other currencies would would really just start to grow and grow and it would become an extremely valuable currency. Um, but you know, they're not going to want to do that. You're going to hear all about how, oh, uh, exports would suffer because it'll be harder to get dollars to buy American exports and all that stuff. And all of this is just distractions. It's not true. You should want lazy, fair and money. You want valuable money. You want to stop the IMF from controlling the money. You don't want the central bank digital currency. All these ideas are just awful. Uh, and so <laughs> we need to just really stay on the message of, look, you need private money, money outside the control of states. And that actually is the only way really to fight this declining dollar that's really just going to cease being the central, the, the world reserve currency in our lifetimes, just not next week. And so we need to start thinking about that now. And the U.S. is really just accelerating it with all of the games it plays with using the dollar to control foreign regimes. Um, but we're at the point now, and it's pretty clear that's the road we're going down. Right. Now again, like it's 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 going to be interesting to see this this issue evolve over time. And it's going to be interesting to see again. You know, the 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 one good thing is that you know, from 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 
everything we've, we've talked about here, there's there's a lot of, of different reasons for people to start pay, paying attention to the Fed. Uh, you know, w- w- no, no matter what the conclusions are necessarily, like in, you know, as, as, as the, with, with the National Association of Realtors earlier, um, but the, the more that people are, are interested in, you know, exactly what is this money thing generally, what is this central banking thing generally, um, you know, hopefully that will lead more people to discovering uh, the Mises.org and, and other uh, outlets like it because, again, you know, the the the, be- the best weapon that these people have is the presumption that this is an issue that we shouldn't consider at all, um, and so more more people talking about it and thinking about it. Much in the same way where we've seen the trends, I, I, I think you know a lot more people taking ownership over, you know, food issues, medical issues, things like that. You know, there's nothing like a, a time of crisis to take for people to take more ownership of it. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we're kind of preaching to the choir in terms of, of our audience. They, they, they've, you know, our, our audience has been very good on this issue for, for much longer than your average person. Um, but uh, the, the more that uh, we can get normies into this, uh, this wheelhouse and world, the better off we'll all be. Well, of course, it's the Mises Institute hating the Fed since 1982. So uh, we've been writer for yes. longer, we, <laughs> you might say. So we'll go ahead and wrap up there with this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.